Oh, Ryan. Oh, yeah. Ryan. 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 I was thinking about Ryan. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Regent Bailing? Here. Regent Peterson? Here. Regent Atwell? Here. Regent Bechtel? Here. Regent Delgado? Here. Regent Evers? Regent Greeby? Here. Regent Hall? Here. Regent Jones? Here. Regent Klein? Here. Regent Milner? Here. Regent Mueller? Here. Regent Peterson? Here. Regent Plant? Here. Regent Ring? Here. Regent Tiedemann? Here. Regent Tyler? Here. Regent Whitburn? We have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Before we begin today's agenda, are there board members who wish to declare any conflicts of interest? Seeing none, let's proceed with the agenda. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. The minutes of the October 4th and 5th, 2018 Board of Regents meeting has been provided. May I have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. Motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes and thank you. A report of the Wisconsin Technical College System Board and Higher Ed's Board has been provided. Uh, any comments or questions, Regents, on those reports? No way. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and accept them into the record. Before we get started with President Cross's uh, report this morning, let's give a round warm of applause to Chancellor Gow and his staff for all of their great hospitality. I also wanted to make just a few uh, brief remarks. This time of year is a uh, busy time in business, but also a very busy time on campuses and for our students. We often think of graduation days as springtime events, but for many students, that big day happens in December. In coming weeks, we'll graduate over 10,000 students at the University of Wisconsin system. I know a number of regents are taking part in those graduation ceremonies. Regents, if you haven't yet spoke at a graduation, I highly, highly encourage you to do so. Uh, it, it's a lot of fun and reminds us why we spend so much time working on matters like this. Uh, graduation days are great. If you haven't taken part in a graduation, uh, see me or any of the available 12 chancellors seated behind you. I know they'd love to have you on campus. I also think, let's give a, an early round of applause for our 10,000 graduates as they begin to uh, get ready for their very special day to our graduates. With that, President Cross, please come forward with your President's Report. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, today is a special day for a couple of folks here, uh, and I think we need to recognize that. Uh, Regent Ring, happy birthday. Uh, <laughs> Gary Bennett, happy birthday. So, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Ryan and Gary. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. We needed to embarrass both of them, so. <laughs> it worked, he says. <laughs> I will start with a brief update from the state legislative front. Uh, Members of our team are working closely with Governor-elect Evers' transition team to discuss our state budget proposal and several policy issues in advance of the upcoming session. This is in addition to our ongoing discussions with legislative leadership in both houses. We continue to receive positive responses to our budget requests, including our pay plan request. We are also working with each institution to outline advocacy strategies, leveraging the unique strengths and relationships they, per, they possess. In the coming months, we will be making the case for our budget to the governor, to legislators, and the public in general, and I will keep the board informed of those efforts moving forward. On the federal front, Secretary DeVos and the Department of Education recently proposed new Title IX rules. We expected this, and at my direction, the UW System Task Force was formed to review and propose the proposed rules and to provide recommendations regarding those proposals. 
The proposed rules were published in the Federal Register in this past week and will be open for public comment for 60 days. Uh, one quick follow-up on a presentation at the October board meeting. At that time, Ben Passmore, uh, Associate VP for Policy Analysis and Research, led a presentation of our second annual report on our 2020 forward strategic framework. I'm pleased to share that uh, the webpage he announced is now up and running, uh, and you can see that online. Now it's time for our student spotlight. Uh, I see Chancellor Gow is getting ready to introduce Brittany. Tribula, a senior at UW La Crosse studying biomedical sciences with a minor in psychology. Along with being a full-time student and a teaching assistant for the anatomy and physiology class that works with cadavers, Brittany works at Gunnarsson Tri-State Ambulance in the region where she practices a variety of skills she's learned here at UWL. But as we are about to hear, she's doing more than just helping with the excellent service the health organization provides. She's also looking to improve the safety of the community with a new initiative she's spearheading at UWL and other community partners. So please join me in welcoming Brittany. Brittany, welcome. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Brittany Tribula. Like you said, I'm a senior at UWL and um, I've taken the initiative to kind of get the Stop the Bleed program into the La Crosse area. Um, so I've been working with Tri-State Ambulance, Gunderson, and um, La Crosse Fire, and pretty much just all the first responder agencies in the western Wisconsin region. Um, along with that, I've just kind of been training community members on how to do hemorrhage control and um, just trying to get the word out there, kind of like CPR. Do you guys have any questions for me? <laughs> so how does this work? Um, so if you guys have ever heard of it, it's um, actually called Stop the Bleed, and it was signed into effect in 2013 by President Obama. So it's kind of just a national campaign, but not a lot of people... Um, really know about it yet, so we're still trying to just get the word out there and have more awareness on it. So it pretty much just goes and teaches um, community members how to do hemorrhage control, so um, tourniquet use, direct pressure, and wound packing with tourniquets, um, gauze, and hemostatic dressings. Did you practice on cadavers? <laughs> no, that wouldn't work so well since they don't really believe. <laughs> That was a trick question. <laughs> how, how, how long does it take to learn the, these skills? Is it like a, a month-long course or a semester? Oh, no, or? not even that. It's very simple. It's only an hour and a half course. So, yep, it's very simple, and it's just kind of like the CPR course. So it's just one little course, and you get everything in, and then you're good to go. What's it called again? Stop the Bleed. Stop the Bleed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Who, ahead, uh, repeat, would you tell us again, who's in part of the, your coalition? Who have you been working with? Again, um, and explain, and explain if, with it also as you, as you tell us that, were there any problems in drawing, uh, in drawing people together for this? Oh, definitely. There was a lot of problems drawing people in. Um, first the challenges. Of all, oh, uh, thank challenges you. Are. Challenges. <laughs> challenges, okay. Um, it was very hard to just get everyone to be on the same page with everything. Um, one group would be doing one thing, the other group would be doing another thing. So we kind of all collaborated and got a Stop the Bleed committee. Um, so that way we have uh, first responders that represent each region of where they're training people. So that way we get together every few months and just go over um, how many people you've trained, what areas have you trained? What kind of community members have you trained? And if you've um, trained other first responders that can actually teach the class. And sorry, what was the first question again? Oh, I, which, which groups are, did you work with? And oh. you partially told us, but do, uh, are they all the same types of groups or different types of groups? Um, I worked with registered nurses at Gunderson, at um, Toma VA. Um, there's been groups at Sparta, um, all the way to Bangor, and um, I've worked with uh, Dr. Mason Fisher. I don't know if you know him. He's the chief of surgery at Gunderson. Um, I've worked with 
Lacrosse Fire and um, the Western Healthcare Coalition, as well as um, Tri-State Ambulance and just all the other first responder groups in that region. I understand you have a short video. We, oh, can yeah. We that, can we cue that now? <laughs> yeah, sure. Are you going to teach us? Hi, my name is Brittany Tribula, and I am a super senior at UW Lacrosse. I'm actually from Nielsville, Wisconsin, so it's like central Wisconsin, a very small town, 2,500. Um, we do have the world's largest talking cow, but that's about it. <laughs> UWL was the only school that I applied to. That was the school that I wanted to go to, so I was very happy that I got in. Right now, I'm kind of unsure. I was heading towards PA, but um, we'll see where biomedical sciences takes me. I went to a trauma conference about two years ago at Gunderson, and the chief of surgery from the Sandy Hook incident was there. And he talked about how they had all these little kids coming in from the, sh or the shooting, or was supposed to, but then only about a few kids actually showed up and the rest of them died. So I thought that was pretty a huge impact, and especially going to a school. Um, UWL is pretty big and it's getting bigger, so I thought that would be a good idea to bring to lacrosse and UWL. I actually proposed it to Gunderson and then I started working with lacrosse fire and um, Gunderson Ambulance as well, Gunderson Tri-State Ambulance. And we kind of just all collaborated and got Western Healthcare Coalition in there involved as well and the medical director and all these other people to um, initiate this program. It's pretty much how you should be trained on hemorrhage control because it's just like any AED situation, how the community should be aware of what to do in those types of circumstances because they're going to be the first ones to respond to those. So people will learn about direct pressure, tourniquets, hemorrhage control, um, kind of just like what to do in those kinds of situations, how to handle them, um, different types of injuries. So you have your torsal junctional, um, you have your extremities and all those kinds of um, different areas. And in the kit, it actually includes trauma shears, um, gloves, uh, a military bandage, um, gauze, two chest seals, and a tourniquet. Most people just don't really think about what to do in these kinds of circumstances. And this is just kind of pretty much whatever you need for bleeding control and um, those kinds of injuries. I kind of want to initiate other things too, like I want to help the community out with things that we don't have. I want to push them to be better and be more proactive towards other things. Um, just kind of have new ideas that it's not a bad thing to be the first um, part in the city to do something or part in the state to have this program or stuff like that. Thank you very much, Brittany. Yeah, we're all very proud of you. That's Absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned graduates, and she will be graduating in May, and I will be very honored to shake your hand at that ceremony. Matter of fact, why don't we practice that right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, pretty impressive. Uh, now for some news from around the system, so I'd again I'd direct your attention to the big screen. UW lacrosse students are near the top nationally for paying back their student loans. UWL's excellent job placement rates and award-winning It Makes Sense financial literacy program contribute to high five-year repayment rates for Pell Grant recipients. 82% of students pay toward their loan principal five years later. UW Parkside Assistant Chancellor of Human Resources and Employee Engagement Sharonda Glass receives the Milwaukee Business Journal Top HR Award in the government category. Vice Chancellor Scott Menke credits Sharonda with creating a strong relationship between HR and UW Parkside faculty and staff. Sharonda says the key to building trust is to remember there is a human side to everything. 
The UW Green Bay community is inspiring 1,700 fifth graders from 29 schools to begin dreaming about college. In October, more than 250 college students served as tour guides and role models for the annual Future Phoenix Field Trip Days. A UW Eau Claire kinesiology research study led the Eau Claire Police Department to change how officers carry their equipment. The study found that load-bearing vests significantly reduce lower back pain experienced with the traditional duty belt. The results have attracted the interest of law enforcement agencies across the country. UW Whitewater media arts and game development major Brianna Addy brought witches and wizards to life using sophisticated and professionally valuable video editing tools and techniques. A moving portrait display honored scenes from the Harry Potter movies at the famous Warriors and Wizards Festival in Jefferson. UW Superior held a dedication ceremony on Indigenous Peoples Day for the Mwanda Ijuin, or the place where we come together, Medicine Wheel and Community Gathering Area. The Medicine Wheel represents the human races connected together and is the first of its kind at any four-year college campus in the area. UW Stow recently dedicated Sorensen Hall in honor of Chancellor Emeritus Charles W. Sorensen, who passed away in February. Sorensen, the university's longest serving leader, retired in 2014 after 26 years. Under his leadership, UW Stout doubled its undergraduate programs, won the National Malcolm Baldridge Award for Quality and Performance Excellence, and became Wisconsin's Polytechnic University. UW Stevens Point was selected as the only recipient of a Great Lakes Region Sea Grant Award for Salmon Research. The highly competitive award will help the university's aquaculture facility in Bayfield support land-based Atlantic salmon production in the Great Lakes. The UW River Falls Dairy Judging Team took first place at the World Dairy Expo, a national title they last won in 1995. Dairy judging skills extend well beyond evaluating dairy animals. These experiences teach students skills like commitment, communication, and teamwork, all abilities that will be valuable in their future careers. At a time when there is global interest in increased food production, UW Platteville researchers received a U.S. Department of Agriculture grant to help meet increased demand for food, fiber, and fuel using sustainable practices and the same amount of land. The project integrates research with education and outreach to ensure its value to local farming communities. Three Sisters' educational journeys led to UW Oshkosh's accelerated nursing program. Kiara Terzinski, Daniel Espy, and Amanda Dernbach didn't think to pursue nursing as their first degree. However, thanks to UWO's Excel 12-month program, a second degree option geared towards addressing the nationwide nursing shortage, they have come together as a family passionate for helping others. For many war-scarred veterans, adjusting to civilian life is difficult. Many are finding help through the Feast of Crispian, created in part by two UW-Milwaukee theater faculty. The event uses Shakespeare to help veterans process their trauma and give them the words to convey their emotions. More than half of UW-Madison students take a chemistry course, pointing to the central role chemistry plays in career preparation. This fall, construction began on a state-of-the-art tower and other needed renovations to the university's aging chemistry building. These improvements will reduce bottlenecks in course scheduling and allow the university to accommodate future chemical education and research. PhD student-turned-entrepreneur Paige Peters won federal funding to advance her Milwaukee-based company with the help of a course in small business innovation offered by the UW System-supported Center for Technology Commercialization. Her company is piloting a revolutionary wastewater treatment system to reduce public health risks in flood-weary Midwestern communities. Well, as you can see, there are some exciting things going on, on our, throughout the system. Finally, we have an update on restructuring. And Associate Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs and Rob Kramer, uh, Vice President for Administration. So Carlene and Rob. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for this time to provide the board with an update on UW Colleges and UW Extension restructuring project. 
Carlene and I will highlight four areas of the project today. The first is an update on the Higher Learning Commission's focused visit earlier this week, and the other three relate to upcoming activities in the project. Carlene, would you start us off? Thank you. The seven UW system institutions that are involved in restructuring recently participated in an on-site visit by the Higher Learning Commission to follow up on the many restructuring activities that the seven institutions have been engaged in over the last six months. As a part of the Higher Learning Commission change of structure process, we are required to undergo a site visit within six months of the change. As you recall, UW system received approval for the change of structure from the Higher Learning Commission on June 29, 2018. The on-site visit took place on December 3rd and 4th on the UW-Madison campus, where representatives from the seven receiving institutions gathered for the meetings. The two peer reviewers were Dr. Ralph Kederberg of the <coughs> University of Cincinnati and Dr. Russ Hanna of Arkansas State University. Both reviewers have expertise in management and finance. The reviewers held meetings and conducted interviews with administration, <coughs> faculty, staff, and students from the receiving institutions and the branch campus. As not to interrupt classes, we had faculty members and students participate via teleconference. Approximately 100 people participated in the visit. I want to personally thank the chancellors, the provosts, the chief business officers, the senior student affairs officers, the branch campus leadership, faculty, staff, and my UW system colleagues who participated in these very important meetings with the HLC. I want to thank them for the participation and also to UW system leadership for the preparation of up-to-date materials to document this tremendous endeavor. In order to prepare for the visit, UW System coordinated the creation of a report for the Higher Learning Commission that consists of a system-wide overview of the restructuring activities that are all guided by customized memoranda of understanding between the receiving institutions and the college's administrative service unit and a two-year phase plan. The report also included information about enrollment, budget, transition of the college's programs to the receiving institutions for curriculum, personnel transitions, course offering schedules by campus, organizational charts, a management plan, and lastly, institutional statements created by the seven receiving institutions where they documented their progress in the most critical areas of the restructuring. We had over 1,000 pages of documentation about restructuring for this report. And I believe the regents all have a link to that report. This particular review with the two peer reviewers focused on enrollment and future financial planning to sustain quality and compliance with the HLC criteria at the branch campuses. The reviewers recognized the hard work, high level of organization, thoroughness, and care that each institution has exhibited to accomplish the work of restructuring. We discussed areas of challenge as well as areas of success. We acknowledge the current enrollment challenges before us, and the reviewers observed that these challenges are being embraced and that there is proactive engagement at the institutions to monitor, to strategize, and to plan for future enrollments. In terms of financial planning, institutions provided several examples of how they are working at all levels across the campuses to be strategic with resources while balancing the needs of students. The integration of faculty across the campuses varies depending on how the faculty are organized now by departments or by colleges. A great deal of time was dedicated to the discussion of how to provide appropriate and adequate student support services at the branch campuses. Institutional representatives provided clear supporting examples of the types and amounts of services that they're currently able to provide 
and identified services that are challenging to provide at current levels of support. This is an area that requires ongoing <clears throat> attention. In about a month, the reviewers will provide us with a report from the commission with their findings and recommendations. Moving forward, the seven institutions will include reports about the branch campuses in their four-year and 10-year accreditation reviews. We anticipate that some of the receiving institutions will strategically move academic programs to the branch campuses in order to serve the needs of the region, to meet market demand, and to serve the needs of the communities where the branch campuses are located. This HLC report may serve as the December 2018 milestone report <clears throat> that was anticipated for phase one. We feel confident that the focus visit was successful due to the high level of engagement by our receiving institution and our system offices who are all involved in completing the activities associated with phase one of the restructuring process. It was an excellent opportunity for these institutions to take stock of what they have accomplished, to share successes, to identify challenges, and to discuss solutions that we may all focus on together as we move forward. We thank you for your ongoing support of this project. Thank you, Carlene. Before I um, <clears throat> start my update, <coughs> I also want to thank Carlene for her leadership with the HLC visit. I think the success of it is in large measure due to her um, work. I think it's fair to say she was the strategist, the planner, the coordinator, the facilitator, the guide, and the trusted advisor as we prepared. So thank you very much. <clears throat> I would like to um, touch on a couple of topics. We are now at the midpoint of phase one in the project of restructuring and just over 12 months into the overall effort. <coughs> most of the activities in the restructuring are now taking place at the receiving institutions, which was reflected in the HLC visit, as they uh, operate the branch institutions and plan for 2019-20 and beyond. There are several phases um, in phase one that we're still working through, and I want to highlight the integrated roadmap, service transitions under the MOU, and the closeout preparations. <coughs> So as we, remove, as we move through the remainder of phase one and into phase two, which is July 1st, 2019 to June 30th of 2020, there are four stages that we've kind of organized the work into to get us ready for December of 19. Uh, first, I'd like to direct your attention to the roadmap stage. January 2019 is gonna be a key month for integrating the next cycle of our planning and I'll have a slide later on that dives into that more deeply. I also want to highlight the work stream implementation stage and the third bullet. We're going to do 90, 60, and 30-day check-ins as we count down towards June 30th, July 1st. These start in April and um, represent the red zone that we're now in leading up to July 1st when we get out of phase one and move into phase two. <clears throat> so this is that deeper dive into the roadmap piece I wanted to touch on. And there are really six major activities that we're going to bring together in January. Uh, shared services there on the left, which is not part of restructuring, but that work is starting to more and more overlap as we move from the restructuring project into standing up the shared services activities. Um, <clears throat> the UW extension transitions, both to UW System and to Madison, are two key pieces of this along with project closeout work, the MOU transitions, and the student information system conversions. This integration work we're going to be doing in a collaborative work stream meeting in January is really going to focus on bringing the timelines for these six activities together, identifying the dependencies, resource constraints, and resource conflicts across those to make sure that we have a single integrated plan going forward. And we know what we're going to bump into as best we can predict it at this point. Uh, checking in on the MOUs now, as you may recall, this was one of the vehicles we put forward to the HLC <coughs> in January of 2018 with our original submission on how to manage the transition of services 
from UW College's extension to the receiving institutions. We're continuing to provide some services um, through the central group, and we've transitioned some other services now to the receiving institutions. One of the areas that we're transitioning this month is student accommodations because of staff changes, and we're distributing the related funding to the receiving institutions. One of the areas that we're continuing to monitor carefully is staffing because in order to provide the services through uh, UW College's extension, we need to have the teams in place and we track on staffing levels and when there are changes, uh, UW College's extension is either addressing those or escalating the issues. This is a graph or a chart similar to what you've seen in the past. It's been updated now on the far right to reflect the uh, acceleration of the student accessibility and accommodations and we'll continue to use this to monitor and guide our efforts. So the last piece I wanted to touch out is the um, closeout framework. As you know, a lot of the activities are moving to the receiving institutions over time, but there are other things that we just need to wind up because college is an extension at some point in time will no longer be an organizational unit. Um, this is the framework we're continuing to use with our four building blocks to organize the work and the planning. We've now established a number of teams in each area to go through particular functional activities start developing those plans, and that will be uh, input to the January work stream meeting to make sure that we bring all this together in a timely and orderly fashion. And with that, I think Carly and I are available for any questions. Before, the, if I may, before the, <coughs> they do, <coughs> um, HLC team, both Ralph and Russ, were incredibly impressed. And you could tell they were really impressed. Um, and th we had a notebook about five inches thick, as Carlene said, is about, I read it, I read every word of that. Yes, so, you did. Um, <clears throat> it, it, the work that Carlene has done to prepare for HLC was just really impressive and she coordinated a lot of things. But that was all possible because of the work that Rob, the chancellors, and the provosts, and the CBOs, and the faculty, and staff from all these campuses did. And it's not over, but this was an amazing, amazing milestone. And I think I can say honestly that both of those reviewers were blown away. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's even another word I can express. They were really impressed. This is a big project and you're doing this and, and the detail that they were <coughs> exposed to was amazing and they couldn't believe it. And I think I'm accurate in that. And, saying that they were really, really impressed. So my compliments to you, and I know the board wants to ask some questions or may mm -hmm. have, but I want to give you folks a round of applause if I could. Mm -hmm. Regents, any questions for her? Go ahead, Regent Milner. Um, I, I also want to echo what President Cross said, and I want to compliment both of you and compliment anyone that participated in this, and, and particularly Carlene. Uh, I absolutely, it is the receiving institutions, it's the chancellors, it's the provost. Clearly, the information and the work that they've done has been, has been remarkable. But uh, we had a, uh, a couple, uh, Drew and I had an opportunity to have lunch with, with uh, the group and listen to what they had to say. And a couple of things that Ray didn't, didn't mention was, they talked about the honesty that they heard. The, uh, yes, they talked about the preparation and how it was unique. The preparation was really extraordinarily unique. But they also talked about the honesty about some of the issues that could not yet be decided mm -hmm. and that we were working through and the fact that we didn't try and uh, hypothesize or gloss over, but we dealt with them directly and they were impressed with that. So I want to thank uh, the whole, everyone that's involved in this because this is a real important undertaking for us. Thank you. Regents, other questions for our two panelists? Regent Mueller. Well, let me as well echo your hard work. But I have to ask in this very, you know, you have a really busy month coming up. At this point, at this critical juncture, what do you think our greatest risk is? And, and <clears throat> in bringing this project to completion? I, I think the greatest risk is um, just the, the 
amount of work still involved in the, the staffing um, at college and extension because some of those individuals, um, November of 19 is kind of the end of their employment, so how do we maintain that? And really then moving the activities over to the receiving institutions and the chancellors because that really becomes the focal point now. And the people at those campuses have been working remarkably hard and um, that's where the real benefits are long term. So getting that transition right, getting some of these you know, administrative things just off their plates so that they can focus on the student and faculty facing things. Carly may have some other thoughts on that. My last comment to the reviewers as I dropped them off at the hotel was, do you see any risks? I needed to ask that. And they did not identify a risk, but they said that an area that, in their own way, an area that needs attention would be the student support services. They're impressed with the attentiveness and the focus that the campus people have, but please give ongoing attention to that area. And for them, risk means that we would be at risk of not being in compliance or meeting a criteria to the level that would be sufficient. So ongoing attention, be on guard. May I, may I respond Our to President that, uh, Regent Mueller? Um, I think the honesty that Regina was talking about, that was an issue we were very honest about with them in several forums. So I think there are, from my perspective, at a 50,000 foot level, two major risks. One is the budget, and why is that important, making sure that's handled well. That's because the student support activities on these campuses were depleted in many ways, and now how do we, how do we restore that in a way that makes sense? And that's gonna require some investment. The second is the continuity of educational programs. And uh, that's not as big a risk because I think we're doing that very well. But those two issues are probably paramount to me uh, as, as two of our greatest risks. The mechanical, boy, that's not a right way to express it, Rob, but the technical aspects of making sure the student information system, all those, the financial aid processes, the, the admissions, those are things we'll work out uh, but it's going to take some budget infusion to uh, bring the student support services up to the level they need to be on these campuses. Fair assessment from both yes. of you. Yes. Regents, other questions for our two panelists? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and excuse our panelists. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Carlene and Rob. And now we'll turn to item uh, number five, report of committee actions. Uh, Region Atwell, if you could start us off with a report <coughs> of the actions taken by the <coughs> Business and Finance Committee. So the first item of business was the minutes of the October 4th meeting, which were approved of the Business and Finance Committee. We then received two reports, which were item uh, 2B and 2C. Um, these are reports that are provided on a regular basis, one dealing with uh, the annual faculty turnover. And then the other is the annual report on faculty and staff base salary adjustments and additional compensation payments. There was uh, um, considerable discussion about both of these reports. They did not require action. They were received and discussed. Dr. Shanita Brokenberg, UW System Senior Associate Vice President, Chief Human Resource Officer, presented information on UW System faculty turnover during fiscal year 2018 and a report on compensation adjustments received by the faculty and staff outside of any regular state approved pay plan. Uh, annual faculty turnover across the UW system for FY18 averaged 7.25. There was quite a bit of variability across the system. It doesn't look so nice today. <laughs> <laughs> Is that me? <laughs> you want me to help you? <laughs> Can I use your gavel? <laughs> <laughs> so faculty turnover across the system averaged 7.25% um, with a total of 434 faculty leaving UW employment during the year. We also looked at the longer term trend from uh, fiscal year 14 to fiscal year 18. The overall faculty numbers went down from 6,480 to 5,983. Um, of the decline or of the turnover uh, in FY18, the 434, 317 were tenured and 117 were probationary uh, tenure track faculty. With respect to, to uh, 
the one-time base adjustments uh, outside of the normal pay plan, 30.61% of all staff across the system received some base adjustments during the fiscal year. These totaled $40.1 million. Um, UW Chancellors reallocated $30.1 million to fund one-time lump sum payments. So there was a robust conversation followed by questions with the regions on what does the data mean? Any faculty turnover or any turnover report gives you an aggregate number, but it doesn't tell you what and why is really going on, and we had a good discussion about that. Regent Delgado wanted to know how the turnover related to salaries and compensation. Uh, were we being poached? What were we, what were we, uh, what were we doing to poach back? Um, Regent Mueller asked if the faculty who left were replaced by instructors in a different category. So um, did we move from tenured, fac tenured track faculty to, uh, <coughs> to other forms of instruction? Um, there was uh, interest in the impacts of turnover across the system because of who was leaving and why, so trying to get below the aggregate data. And the chance, several chancellors, the ones that were in the room, were invited to come up and provide their perspectives on what the meaning of the faculty turnover report uh, was. So Chancellors Blank, Levitt, and Mone addressed the committee on how current compensation levels were problematic in retaining talent and described tactics used to realign resources available, such as use of adjunct faculty to preserve research time and subsequent work overloads on faculty. So those two uh, reports did not require approval, and we moved on to the items that did require the approval of the committee and uh, will, require, will require the approval of the board. I'd like to go through uh, all those actions taken and then uh, consolidate them into a single motion. Uh, go ahead, Regent Atwell. Okay. So these were items uh, 2H through 2M. Uh, the first two dealt with contractual agreements. The first, EAB Student Services Collaborative. We had a presentation on that by UW System Associate Vice President Ben Passmore. He gave an overview of what EAB's work is to track student uh, predictive analytics and student support to, to provide more timely intervention when students are struggling uh, to encourage a system or to encourage student success across the system. This uh, EAB is being used currently by several campuses. The presentation uh, included a report from uh, UW Milwaukee Provost Johannes Britz, uh, who shared the remarkably positive experience his campus faculty, staff, and students have had using these tools. So the committee uh, uh, um, approved a five-year term contract to, to implement EAB across the system in the aggregate amount of $10.8 million. UW-Madison uh, presented a contractual agreement with Johnson Controls. Uh, Vice Chancellor Laurent Heller addressed the committee. It's a master-sponsored research agreement with Johnson Controls expected to generate $1 million over the life of the contract. That was approved. And we then moved on to amendments to the bylaws to the Board of Regents and changes to Regent policies relating to UW system trust funds. This is part of the work of uh, reviewing uh, the ongoing work, which is really quite extensive to review our bylaws and to conform, uh, to, to take out stuff that's irrelevant and conform them to what um, practices are now. The first uh, dealt with um, the trust funds. It was a presentation by uh, the uh, percussion section of the system, uh, Vice President Sean Nelson. <laughs> um, we could give him a round of applause for his work on the drums, but I see Regent Bailing uh, glaring at me to stay on task. So, uh, so this, this, uh, we, re we changed to clarify the role of the Business and Finance Committee and the UW System Trust officers now that the State of Wisconsin Investment Board manages the investment activity for these funds. And uh, so in addition to kind of cleaning up the language to more um, accurately conform to the to, to uh, how, how the SWIB arrangement is functioning. We also eliminated the Subcommittee on Investments um, in, in any obsolete, obsolete uh, policies. Then um, Jess Lathrop, Executive Director and Corporate Secretary of the Board of Regents addressed the Committee on Updating and Revising several Regent policies. So uh, the first uh, one, two, uh, two H, uh, dealt with public records management. It clarifies that the Board of Regents own all UW system records and incorporates current practice into policy. Then we dealt with uh, um, changes to Regent policy regarding emeritus status. 
The updated policy uh, will be directed at the Board of Regents and all UW system faculty and staff. Um, 2J removed uh, the um, University Insurance Association. It remains intact, but is removed as anomalous in that, uh, in that other like organizations are not under the Regent policy, so it wasn't necessary. In 2K, the mandatory refundable fee policies in July 2013 state law was changed to disallow the collection of such a mandatory fee by the Board of Regents, which renders the Regent policy regarding mandatory refundable fee policies obsolete. So we cleaned that up. And then 2L um, was review and approval of UW-Madison's non-resident, graduate, and professional school tuition proposals. We had extensive discussion. Chancellor Blank addressed the committee and the requested changes will keep these tuition rates below or in line with rates at peer institutions, ensuring that the institution continues to provide an excellent value in the higher education. Um, and then the 2M dealt with the approval of salary ranges for senior executives. Dr. Shanita Brokenberg presented an overview of comparisons based on currently available market data. Uh, the salary ranges had actually not been updated since uh, 2013. We had an extensive discussion. Uh, Regent Greeby, Delgado, Mueller, and Atwell had asked questions about benchmarking data sets and sample size. And uh, after a fulsome discussion, the committee approved moving forward with salary ranges one through eight based on the available of data and a clear rationale uh, as to how the ranges were being changed. Um, so we, we are bringing that for a roll call vote to today's uh, meeting. We deferred on range number nine in order to get better clarity on the data and on the rationale that should be applicable for that, for that range. Um, so uh, we also had a um, report of the Vice President's UW System Vice President for Administration, Rob Kramer, who does not play the drums, uh, gave a quick update on several ongoing projects including the, in, the growth of the information security team, the VoIP, voice over internet protocol for phones, which had resulted in significant savings, and work on amending current lease for cost savings and human resource efficiency improvements. So the Business and Finance Committee supports sending um, the amendments, as well as the um, tuition for graduate, um, non-resident graduate, and professional <coughs> school tuitions, and the salary ranges for senior executives. Thank you, Regent Atwell. I'll accept that motion. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say, excuse me. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Per the motion and second, without any discussion, roll call vote, please. Regent Bailing? Yes. Regent Peterson? Yes. Regent Atwell? Yes. Regent Bechtel? Yes. Regent Delgado? Yes. Regent Evers? Regent Greeby? Yes. Regent Hall? Yes. Regent Jones? Yes. Regent Klein? Yes. Regent Milner? Yes. Regent Mueller? Yes. Regent Peterson? Yes. Regent Plant? Yes. Regent Ring? Yes. Regent Tiedemann? Yes. Regent Tyler? Yes. Regent Whitburn? Motion passes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Regent Atwell. And, and per Regent Atwell's uh, recommendation, I too think Vice President Sean Nelson, please stand and take a bow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now we'll turn to Regent Milner to bring a report of the Education Committee. Regent Milner, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm uh, pleased to report on the activities of the Education Committee at our meeting yesterday. Uh, I'd also like to remind and advise my colleagues, if you buy new technology, don't do it the week before uh, Regent <laughs> meeting. Uh, one should know how to turn off one's cell phone. Uh, first, in support of the UW system restructuring of UW colleges and UW extension, the Secretary's Office recommended that we update four Regent policy documents. This way, our Regent policy will accurately reflect the structure of the 13 accredited UW system institutions. Therefore, the committee unanimously approved um, rescission, replacement, and removal of four Regent policy documents. Next, we heard from Interim Vice President Karen Schmidt, who provided an update on UW system restructuring of UW colleges and UW extension. 
Vice President Schmidt introduced Dr. Aaron Brower, UW System Associate, Senior Associate Vice President and Executive Director of the Division of Continuing Education, Outreach, and E-Learning. And that is C-O-L. I, 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 it, it, they've changed the name. <laughs> uh, this was a division of UW Extension and now provides programs and services under the UW System Administration. This is all part of the merger and this is one of the things that was retained by UW System Administration and it's one of the things because of the retention and the, the difference in administration and uh, the work that's done by this division, it's important that we understand what this division is all about. Dr. Brower presented the division's new name, which is UW Extended Campus, much easier to say. The UW Extended Campus extends the physical boundaries of all UW campuses to the borders of the state and beyond. UW Extended Campus programs continue to be collaborative partnerships with UW institutions that has been true for COL. The, uh, that's the old name. The UW Extended Campus goal is to enable the UW system and its campuses to, expend it, to expand access to higher learning for adult, non-traditional, and professional students. The development of the UW Extended Campus is a growth strategy for the UW system, and it, it is well aligned with UW system's 2020 forward strategic goals and priorities for the educational pipeline. Afterwards, the, um, uh, the committee considered three agenda items from UW, um, Steve, UW Stevens Point. First, Chancellor Bernie Patterson and Provost Greg Summers provided the committee with a brief update on the process and timeline for the Point Forward proposal. Second, the committee unanimously approved the UW Stevens Point procedures related to financial emergency or program discontinuance requiring faculty layoff or termination. Third, UW Stevens Point sought approval for a Doctor of Physical Therapy degree. <coughs> Provost Summers stated that the curriculum was developed in partnership with local health care providers and has the specific intent of graduating physical therapists to serve rural communities and to help address the critical shortage of physical therapists in central and northern Wisconsin. The curriculum is designed to meet the accreditation criteria established by the Commission on the Accreditation of Physical Ther uh, Therapy Education. And we had a long <coughs> discussion about the difference between a research PhD and the doctorate, this type of doctorate. And if anyone is interested in that, I encourage the board members that were in the Business and Finance Committee to talk to Dr. Brower afterwards if you're unsure about what that differentiation is. Next, the committee unanimously approved a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Writing and Applied Arts at UW-Green Bay. Implementation of this degree is well-timed because emerging markets for writing and storytelling production have exploded in recent years. For example, streaming television services like Amazon and Netflix drive workforce demand for creative writers, one of which we have sitting in our midst, uh, Regent Peterson. Uh, program faculty will work in partners with uh, Northwestern Wisconsin Technical College to develop complementary and transferable coursework. Several, commun several community businesses and sites will sponsor internships and experimental uh, learning experiences for students. Graduates will be equipped to meet market demand for nonfiction writers, science writers, screenwriters, podcasters, editors, publishers, librarians, and technical writers. Thereafter, the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee proposed to build upon two existing degree programs by adding both a Master's of Arts, MA, in African and African Diaspora Studies and a Clinical Doctorate in Occupational Therapy. The Master's program will provide for an option for doctoral students who must exit the doctoral studies with a ma who 
uh, must exit the doctoral study with a master's degree because the MA program is better aligned with their professional goals. This program will also meet workforce demand for local professionals who seek additional um, accreditation and advanced knowledge. The Professional Occupational Therapy Doctorate responds to a forthcoming accreditation requirement from the Accreditation Council for Occupational Therapy Education. The accreditor requires universities to convert existing master's programs to professional doctorates, once again a professional doctorate as opposed to a PhD, by 2027. This degree program also supports a strategic priority of the UW system to produce more healthcare professionals to meet the demand for healthcare services in underserved areas. Next, the Education Committee received the fifth and final presentation related to our teacher education initiative. A panel of graduate students and recent graduates from UW La Crosse Teachers Education Program delivered an, a program entitled What is the experience of students and graduates of UW System Schools and the Colleges of Education. And we'd like to thank Regent Ring for his suggestion of this program. Thank you, Regent Ring. Look, looking forward, we ask Interim Vice President Schmidt to charge a task force. We would like its members to address the two following questions. How can the UW system collaboratively with key stakeholders develop financial incentive programs for students to improve affordability, reduce student loan debt, address teacher workforce shortages, and increase access, enrollment, and graduation from teachers education and administrative leadership programs at our UW colleges and schools of education? And number two, how can the UW system engage with key stakeholders to understand their concerns and to consider how to raise public esteem for the teaching profession in the state of Wisconsin? Finally, Betsy Morgan delivered a presentation entitled UW La Crosse Community-Based Experiential Learning. Notably, she was joined by 10 professors and students who personally described their experiential learning experience with the Education Committee. All right, it was a busy time, but I have some resolutions for us. There's resolution 1.1b sub 1, which is the approval of the precision and replacement of Regent policy documents. Resolution 1.1.b sub 2, approval and remo removal of two obsolete Regent policy documents. Resolution 1.1D sub 2, approval of UW Stevens Point procedures related to financial emergency or program discontinuance requiring faculty layoff and termination. Resolution 1.1D sub 3, approval of physical therapy doctorate at UW Stevens Point. Resolution 1.1E, approval of the Bachelor of Fine Arts in Writing and Applied Arts at UW Green Bay. Resolution 1.1F sub 1, approval of the Masters of Arts in African and African Diaspora Studies at UW Milwaukee. And finally, <coughs> Resolution 1.1F sub 2, approval of the Occupational Therapy Doctorate, doctorate at UW Milwaukee. Thank you, Regent Milner. I'll accept that motion. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Motion passes and we accept the committee report. Thank you, Regent Milner. Thank you, and that concludes my report with one comment. I'd like to thank the, uh, the various universities for working with the community for job needs because these reflect that, that work. Thank you, and agree. Now we'll call on Regent Delgado to present a report of Capital Planning and Budget Committee. All right. Um, I have uh, 12 resolutions that, I, uh, that we passed and we're proposing to the board. Um, Vice President Rowe had no compassion on anyone, and she, was, uh, <laughs> she decided that she wanted to work the crowd, so she did. So I'm going to be uh, talking to each one of them, and then I would like to put them all together. Besides that, I have two observations which uh, followed. 
Uh, the first one is Resolution I-3B, which is brought by UW Milwaukee, requests authority to construct the $7.7 .7 million Northwest Quadrant Student Health Services. Um, we have heard a lot about the Quadrant. Obviously, this is a facility that has been around and has to be uh, developed. And this use is very important because the facilities for medical services have been distributed. And, yeah. It has a unique, a unique uh, requirement uh, that the, a, a $29 annual fee is going to be used for this, and the students and everybody has approved it, so it appears to be the best use of the money, and we thought that they should proceed with it. Um, uh, 3C from uh, UW-Milwaukee requests approval to demolish another part of the quadrant. Um, I don't think they're doing it out of spite. We don't give them money. They're going to tear it down. I think they found that this is the best, the best use for the, for the place is just to clear the land, and they promised me they're going to make it an open area until they find another need for the land. But uh, UWM obviously can use, being an urban university, can use open, open area. And this is the least cost way of handling it, the building obviously has been hanging around. It does read a lot of work. Might as well bring it down because there's no, it would be a better solution for, for the university. Item 3D brought by, uh, or resolution 3D brought up by uh, UW uh, Platteville requesting authority to construct a Babel Hall addition and renovation. I don't know if I pronounced that properly, but it doesn't matter. Phase two project for an estimate cost of $23.8 million from the general fund supported borrowing. Um, and what this is gonna do is gonna provide some, um, renovates a lot, uh, the addition to the, to the Babel Hall to support instructional laboratories and research space in classrooms. Resolution 3E brought by UW Stout requests authority to increase the budget of the Price Commons first floor renovation projects by $900,000, program revenue supporting borrowing, and $100,000 cash. So it's a total of a, a million dollar addition, so it's an $8.6 million project. And, uh, the project that, we, that they're working on will remodel the first floor of the Commons it would upgrade all the mechanical systems. The increased budget is needed because after doing some archaeology in the building, they find that um, there is additional work needed. And this is what happens when you are re you're fixing old buildings. Invariably, you find surprises. And then we have uh, Resolution 3F brought by UW System requests authority to increase the budget of the UW River Falls Dairy Plant remodel project by $500,000 uh, program revenue cash for a revised estimate of 2.4 uh, to expand uh, this pilot plant. Apparently, we have been, uh, we have received some uh, brand new um, best uh, of industry dairy equipment, and we would like to expand the building to make use of it. And uh, Dean Van Galen has promised me that ice cream and cheese will happen when we visit the We'll have a chance to show that he have a chance to show us that the building, in fact, will was worth the money because the equipment will be fantastic. Item 3G brought by U UW System requests authority to construct three maintenance and repair projects at an estimated cost of 3.7 million, and this is a variety of uh, facility maintenance and utility repair in Madison, and some renovation programs or renovation at UW River Falls. Item uh, 3H, or Resolution 3H, brought by UW System, requests authority to execute the remainder of the design contract and construct the UW Madison Biochemistry Building Loading Dock Renovation Project for $1.5 million. What we have here is that we have a, a dock that begins to flood and um, anytime there's a major rain, and we have had quite a few major rains, and we have been promised that when they fix this, the problem will not move down the block to the next building, that apparently they're gonna solve the problem so that we don't see it again. We'll, we'll follow up on that one when they get the work done. Resolution 3.I, uh, brought by UW System, requests authority to execute the remainder of the design contract and construct the UW-Madison Engineering Hall, Plaza 
entrance project for $1.4 million using gift funds. Given that this is the engineering building, I was very sympathetic. I thought engineers should be able to enter the building in style. And uh, this is the work that has to be done. Um, item 3J, brought by UW System, requests authority to execute the remainder of the design contract and construct the UW Madison Primate Center backup generator project for $1.2 million. And this is a requirement of uh, accreditation by an association that has a lot of A's, AAA, LAC, and um, it's a, they, they are the credit research program. This is very important to us to be accrediting any way that we can, and um, it's an important aspect of it, so we, we certainly intend to do it, and it's going to solve a problem for the Harlow Laboratory, too, so from that perspective, this will be very adequate. Item 3K brought by UW Madison requests authority to construct a UW extension, uh, $4 million level hall floor. And um, this is the, we have, uh, these are centers that came to them from the extension, and they have been expanding the number of uh, rooms available for, for the, well, actually for the, for the programs. And so this is, a continuation of an existing program to enhance those buildings. Uh, resolution 3L brought by UW System requests authority to execute the remainder of the design contract and construct the UW Extension Upham Woods Administration Building Replacement Project. I like to see the acronym for that. Uh, $3.1 million of gift and grants and this is a, an 8,000 8, square foot replacement facility. In uh, in this and, and this is a, this is a, a very picturesque location. And we were told that we will hold the board of regents meeting sometime there. When they, no, not really, but uh, <laughs> definitely we were invited. That this would be a great place to visit. Item. One or point three M brought by UW System requests authority to renew leases for University of Wisconsin System Administration. The the leases are going to be extended to the year twenty five. We have two leases, and this is the lease cost for doing the work, and um, and that that will do, that will do it all. So I am requesting. I'm moving that uh, the board approve resolutions I three B through. I3M uh, that, been, that, that were approved by the committee. Thank you, Regent Delgado. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion seconded. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? I have two other comments. We had a report on the semi-annual status of leasing activities. Go ahead. And uh, that was done very well. The other one is that we also had a report, which is very interesting, on the condition of our buildings. And I will give you just two numbers for you to entertain. Uh, and these are very round numbers because I, I wrote them in, in my notes. 61 million square feet of property is what we own, of which 32 million is in good condition. About 20 million workable, and 7 million is bad. And um, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of square footage, and there's a lot of work to do. Maintenance for us is extremely in interesting and important issue. I have been discussing with some of the folks involved with this building. As you can see, this is a great facility, but in the 1960s and 70s, we had a case of the cheapness that um, really, and ugliness too, by the way, uh, that really created buildings that at this point uh, becomes terribly difficult to maintain. Uh, because they put, the stuff is not maintainable. And I have observed it from campus to campus. So when I come here and see this magnificent facility, it makes me terribly happy that we're not repeating the mistake. We can't afford to build it cheap, and I don't like to build ugly. But the fact is that cheap is not the solution. So we are not doing it. I, I guarantee you that what we are doing these days is absolutely better as money was spent. Maintainability is an essential element for buildings like this that have so much use and so important to us. Um, this board has obviously issues. We need to find the resources in which we can maintain or replace these buildings with the seven million. And we want to address the 20 million 
square feet before they become bad. Okay, so uh, we, have, we have work to do. I realize this doesn't have the charm and the, you know, the allure of uh, uh, you know, the primate lab, you know. The monkeys are hanging around. No, uh, this is different. But this is where our students live and our employees work, our professors work. If it sounds passionate, it's because I do have intimate contact with rust in my background, okay, and broken concrete. I did spend a lot of years dealing with that, and you fall behind, and now the price goes up a lot. Uh, we're going to have to pay attention to this, and I intend to, for as long as I'm here, to be an advocate for, you know, in rust we trust. No, we're going to get rid of it, okay? <laughs> and uh, let's see, that cross presented information. On uh, transforming science education, it's a very good uh, um, report. And then Alex Rowe, after abusing us for all that time, updated the Committee of Progress on the Capital Budget. And we have the Capital Budget meeting, uh, the committee, the state committee meeting was supposed to be held in December, will not. And now we don't know when. We're working with the, the new Governor's Transition Committee to make sure that it gets done. And we do have some projects that are critical because they do need expansion. I mean, they do need extra funding for second phases. That are, the first phase is going on right now. And if we delay between first and second phase, it costs us a lot of money. People go home, they have to come back. So we, we're gonna have to work very closely with the governor, who we think will have a full appreciation of what we're talking about and his, and his, uh, his staff. And that's difficult because nobody in the position Okay, so I advise you that that is the case, and I thank you very much. This is the end of the report. Thank you, Re Regent Delgado, and your reports are accepted. Now we'll turn to Regent Hall for a report of the Ready Committee. Regent Hall, the floor is yours. Before I start, I would like to publicly recruit Regent Delgado to help me with my building during my day job as one of my champions because it was established in 1907 and we're, we're working on some building renovations. Your voice would be great. As 1907 was a good year. <laughs> 1977. Oh, okay. 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 Well, my, my building was built in 1907. I'm calling you. So, anyway, good morning. <laughs> um, the READY Committee, which stands for Research, Economic Development, and Innovation, reviewed and approved the minutes of the October 4, 2018 meeting held at UW Parkside. UW La Crosse highlighted the on-ramp program. Dr. Samantha Foley, Assistant Professor of Computer Science at UW La Crosse, discussed how this innovative project, funded in part by WISIS, bridges the gap between traditional computing environments and high-performance computing systems that are notoriously difficult to use. On-Ramp is a platform that allows all computer science students a basic understanding of complex parallel and distributive computer systems. One day, On-Ramp could even be used for K-12 students as an early introduction to computer science. The Wisconsin Partnership Program of the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health presented its 2018 annual report, its 2019 through 2024 five-year plan, and recommendations for the appointments of four members to its oversight and advisory committee. By way of background, in 2000, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Wisconsin converted from a nonprofit service corporation to a for profit. The Wisconsin Insurance Commissioner approved that conversion, which distributed the proceeds from the sale to the Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and to the Medical College of Wisconsin. 35% of the funds were allocated for public health initiatives and 65% for the education and research initiatives to advance population health. Dr. Robert Golden, Dean of the UW School of Medicine and Public Health, who's done an outstanding job as a leader, outlined the partnership program's annual report and the five-year plan, highlighting particular programs that are advancing urban research in the areas of Alzheimer's, opioid, 
addiction, rural health initiatives, as well as urban health programs. He shared a video about one such program aimed at combating the health crisis of African American men in Wisconsin. Dr. Golden then introduced the nominees to serve on the Oversight and Advisory Committee. The Board of Regents is now the main oversight body for the Wisconsin Partnership Program, acronym WPP, and Tracy Klein is our Regent Liaison to the WPP. She has diligently reviewed the original order of the Commissioner, the various plans and reports from WPP, past audits from the Legislative Audit Bureau, and she's met with Dean Robert Golden and other members of the UW-Madison School of Medicine and Public Health who run the program and administer the funds. Now, we do have some resolutions that we'll need you to pass. However, before we do that, Regent Klein, would you please add um, some comments to what we've done. Yes, thank you, Regent Hall. Um, as your liaison to the Oversight Committee for the Wisconsin Far Partnership Fund, I, I did a little bit of a deep dive this year, and partially because we're coming up to, well, 19 years since the, or the Commissioner's Order established the Wisconsin Partnership Fund, um, and also because, frankly, some questions had been raised by a concerned citizen. So um, just to, to set the stage, when Blue Cross Blue Shield converted from a, a not-for-profit corporation to a for-profit corporation, somehow the public, the taxpayers, had to receive the value of that corporation. And um, I think in order to make sure that the proceeds weren't dissipated or used, you know, sort of um, for purposes and then, and, then, and then not being available to the public on an ongoing basis, um, the plan of conversion that was approved by the Board of Directors of Blue Cross Blue Shield and the Insurance Commissioner's Office created um, uh, uh, the Wisconsin Partnership Fund. And at that time, what was specified in the order was the funds were to be distributed evenly to the UW Medical School as well as the Medical College of Wisconsin. The, the, f the feeling was that the two medical schools would provide the accountability to administer an endowment that would be ongoing um, for the benefit of the people of the state of Wisconsin, that both schools would have that infrastructure in place. So um, to be clear, it resulted in the largest gift to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, our portion of that conversion proceeds. Um, right now, and you need to know this, I think, as regents, the fund sits at $388 million. And um, pursuant to the documents, um, and, and this is in the contract specifically, um, the funds are to be held by the UW-Madison Foundation in accordance with its uniform policies. Um, so right now, um, that's where it sits and that's where it must sit. And it sits uh, according to the uniform policies. They deduct 1% annually for all funds up to $250 million, and then 07 after that amount. Um, it's a restricted gift. Um, and then the proceeds are distributed in accordance with the order. Now, one of the things that's a little bit confusing is that uh, the commissioner listened to a lot of commentary at the time that she decided, and it was community groups from <clears throat> throughout the state. So her decision was that 65% would go to medical education and research, which makes a lot of sense with the University of Wisconsin Medical School administering the gift. But then 35% was to go to public health initiatives. And that was, again, in response to all these community groups that really wanted it to be not just focused on the UW, but distributed throughout the state. And I want you to know, um, we went back and read everything, as Eve said, but we, we looked at the definition of public health that was in the commissioner's order because we thought it was important to know what donor intent was. And it says, frankly, public health means population health rather than pub population medicine, focused on the broader determinants of health in communities such as prevention efforts to promote healthy lifestyles for women, children, and families, disease prevention and control, and the control of environmental agents that negatively impact health. So that was that is the donor intent. And I, I tell you this because I believe we have a fiduciary duty to make sure that everything is in order, both from a, a, a contractual and rule-following standpoint, but also that we're honoring this intent. I have reviewed everything very, very carefully. The commissioner order, the agreements, I've looked through the um, 
Uh, Legislative Audit Bureau reports, we have one in 2010, we have one in uh, 2015, we're due for another. And what my conclusions are after reading everything and spending countless hours with Dean Golden and Eileen Smith is that we are, um, we are following the rules. There are, uh, there are two things that, that we need to do and we have been doing and they're not completely within our control, but one is that we have to request again that the insurance commissioner appoint a, re a representative to the oversight body. This board appoints all of the members of the oversight body other than the insurance commissioner's representative and that position has been vacant. Um, the other thing that needs to happen is we are due for an audit next year by the Legislative Audit Bureau. They have resisted. They say they're too busy. We must insist or we must have an out external auditor approved by the commissioner to perform the audit and we, Dean Golden and I will be working on that. Um, there were also concerns raised along the way about the five-year plan and keeping in mind what the donor intent was and looking at the report, and I spent, um, and I want to compliment Dr. Amy, Amy Kind. She is our employee. She's a doctor, but she also chairs the, the committee. And they engage in a long, uh, arduous process to develop the five-year plan, which, by the way, we also compared with the MCW plan, and we find it to be very similar um, in honoring donor intent in terms of this broad public health initiative. But we've developed the plan. I feel very comfortable. It's, com it's in keeping with... Uh, the order um, and um, so consequently I'm, gonna, I'm recommending to you you approve the plan and approve the appointment of new members to the board um, and and know that we are looking at this and we are taking it seriously we thank those uh, who are responsible for entrusting us with this generous gift um, we we believe that it needs to be administered carefully in accord with the donor intent it's a gift to the people of Wisconsin, and we take this duty very seriously. Um, and I want to assure you all that I believe, after careful review, after hours and hours, that it is being administered in accordance with donor intent. And while people might have different views of what public health initiatives ought to be funded, because there's a myriad of those out there, um, what's being funded and what it, the plan is for funding appears to me to be completely consistent with what was envisioned when the when the uh, program was was uh, established. So I will stop there. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them um, and turn it back over to you, Paul. Are there any questions from the board? Okay. So I, I just want to thank um, Regent Klein again for all of her work on WPP and just the diligence um, that she has partaken in because this is very important and the impact of the initiatives that WPP um, is is really taking on I think will positively impact this entire state so um, with that Regent Bailing I move on behalf of the Ready Committee um, there are two resolutions resolution 14e which is the approval of the Wisconsin Partnership Program's five-year plan and Resolution 14C, which is the appointments of four members to the Oversight and Advisory Committee to the WPP. Motion and second. Any questions or discussion? Chair, Mr. President. Go ahead. I personally want to thank Regent uh, Klein for all the work she's done on this. Uh, really spent a lot of time and answering a lot of questions and thinking this through, working with Dean Golden and Eileen. Really, really appreciate that. Very, given your background and your experience, that's really, um, really important, valuable to us. President Cross beat me the punch, but I would re uh, reiterate that as well. Uh, in my office, I received a fair amount of documents and emails. Uh, it was a lot of work to go through those and then uh, make the examination and determine the right course. So know that to our committee chair and to you, Regent Klein, very appreciative of your hard work and thank you. It was an excellent report. Thank you. That concludes our report. Sounds good. Uh, there is a, a motion and a second on the floor. Any other questions or discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion <laughs> passed and report accepted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now we'll turn to Regent Grebe to bring the report of the Audit Committee. Uh, thank you, uh, President Bailing. First, I'm going to deliver the report of the joint meeting of the Audit and Business and Finance Committee, and then I'll move to the Audit Committee, saving the best for last. Um, I, there was a joint meeting of the Audit and Business and Finance Committee uh, yesterday. The primary purpose of that meeting 
was to review the fiscal year 2018 financial report, hear from our new external auditor, and ask questions. Vice President Sean Nelson started our conversation by noting that the UW system is statutorily required to hire an external auditor for fiscal 2018 and 2019. We undertook an extensive procurement process prior to engaging the services of Plant Moran. Plant Moran has provided an unmodified, unmodified or clean audit opinion on this year's financial report. Mr. Nelson noted that with the hard work of the UW staff and Plant Moran, financial statements this year were being presented at least two months earlier than they have in the past. Uh, in addition, the external auditors were available yesterday for questions from the Joint Committee. Diving into the report itself, Associate Vice President Julie Gordon noted that the total net position remained relatively stable from fiscal year 2017, decreasing by $17 million, or 0.3 percent. Uh, changes that are more significant occurred within specific categories of net position, but are primarily related to accounting issues. A restricted net position increased by $501 million, 45.7 percent. Our unrestricted net position decreased nearly $603 million, or 66 percent. Those seemingly very significant changes are due to changed accounting standards for pensions and other post-employment benefits. The accounting adjustments recognize the difference between the value of a plan's assets and the present value of projected benefit payments. Uh, with higher than expected investment earnings in fiscal year 2018, the UW system's portion of the Wisconsin retirement system changed from a net pension liability of $113 million in fiscal 2017 to a $399 million net pension asset in fiscal year 2018. Since the UW system does not manage the Wisconsin Retirement System post-employment benefit programs, Ms. Gordon presented a graph showing changes between years without the required pension adjustments. That graph revealed, as I noted, that without those adjustments, the volatility in our net position smooths out and the UW system's unrestricted position actually remained relatively stable. The UW system finance team also noted a few changes that restated prior year beginning balances. The largest of these adjustments relates to library holdings, which were previously considered inexhaustible, inexhaustible assets and not depreciated. With the recommendation from Plant Moran and in line with current industry practice, the fiscal year 2017 financial statements have been revised to reflect that depreciation, resulting in a $962 million reduction in capital assets. Finally, Ms. Gordon reported that additional campus foundations were now included as discreetly presented component units of the UW system in the 2018 report. We then heard from Vicki Vandenberg, the lead Plant Moran partner who oversaw the financial audit. She highlighted the external auditor's responsibilities and required communications and delivered those. She indicated that UW management fully cooperated with Plant Moran and provided complete access to necessary staff and records. It was noted that Plant Moran continues to consider the previously identified concerns related to information technology policies and procedures to be a significant deficiency. However, the audit team stressed that the UW system has made significant process in this area and recommended that that work continue. There were no other significant deficiencies identified and no material weaknesses were identified. Since Plant Moran will deliver another report next year related to the fiscal year 2019 report, the committee uh, discussed some additional communications that we've requested for that process. That concludes my report on the Joint Audit and Business and Finance Committee. Thank you, Regent Grevy, and the report's accepted. <clears throat> uh, the audit com moving to the Audit Committee. The Audit Committee also met yesterday morning. We discussed the status of our internal audit efforts, system IT security, and emergency preparedness. Our Chief Audit Executive, Lori Stortz, briefly reviewed the progress to date on the fiscal year 2019 audit plan. She confirmed that her office is expected to complete 
the majority of the 2019 audit plan on a timely basis, and we discussed and were satisfied with those components that are not expected to be completed. Ms. Stortz provided a high-level summary of the results of certain of the audits recently issued by the Office of Internal Audit. During that review, the committee engaged in a discussion of the implementation of shared services across the system. The Executive Director of Shared Services, Steve Wildeck, spoke briefly about the efficient delivery of services that shared services can provide to help improve the standardization and consolidation of processes. The committee discussed the challenges and opportunities related to putting that plan into effect. After Ms. Stortz's report, the committee members were reminded that they are encouraged to raise, question, and discuss any audit reports that have been released, regardless of whether they are brought forward at the meeting, if they think that it is necessary and appro uh, or appropriate. <clears throat> to remind the full board, uh, in a change in uh, uh, agenda structure, and in order to be more consistent with the committee's charter, uh, the committee has changed its practice somewhat over the last year such that not every audit is the subject of a specific discussion at our committee meeting. We have a broader purview of responsibilities <coughs> and the new agenda is intended to reflect that. Uh, Regent Mueller recognized Ms. Stortz and her team for following through with the audits, and Ms. Stortz stated that she will continue to collaborate with the LAB. Ms. Stortz then discussed the status of the security system and access audits and some emerging themes arising from those audits. Eight reports have been issued, five are in the field, and one should be in the field in 2019. The auditors and management at the institutions continue to make good progress on those matters. <coughs> Interim Associate Vice President for Information Security, Catherine Mayer, stated that system access remains a key issue and that teams are working on clarifications of policies related to access and the utilization of accompanying technical controls. We were told that the complexity of the UW system and its institutions will result in this process taking some time, but not an inappropriate amount of time. There are certain institutions that have been early adopters of new IT security systems. The committee noted that those early adopters are moving effectively and quickly, uh, and in particular commended Parkside, Superior, and La Crosse for moving ahead of schedule as early adopter implementers. This has been a subject that I know has been uh, a topic of significant concern of, as, of the board as a whole and certainly uh, of the audit committee. Uh, and that uh, action is very appreciated and noted. Ms. Stortz reported on management's progress to date in addressing the audit comments and response plans included in the audit reports. The Office of Internal Audit continues to receive excellent cooperation from management and remains solidly focused on closing IT security audits. We then had a very illuminating discussion regarding emergency preparedness across the system. Vice President for Administration Rob Kramer introduced the topic and noted that the system has been working with UW Madison Police on this topic for years. Associate Vice President for Administrative Services Ruth Anderson provided a report on emergency planning and preparedness at the UW system. Uh, Chief Kristen Roman and Emergency Management Services Coordinator David Lawal, both of the UW-Madison Police, joined the discussion and shared background regarding the robust ongoing training and preparations that are being coordinated throughout the UW system. We agreed that we would encourage an emergency planning update to be included annually at our audit committee meetings. The regents thank the team for the, uh, all they do to keep our campus community safe. Their report was quite frankly quite reassuring as we have discussed as a group on a number of occasions there is nothing more important than the safety of our students, uh, staff, faculty, administration, uh, and the depth uh, and quality of the report we, re we received was, as I noted, very reassuring. That concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Kirby. I know President Cross would also like to uh, <coughs> comment on this issue as well. Go ahead, President Cross. Um, <clears throat> I want to try to draw a distinction between the accountants and the academics. Um, I want to assure the academics in our audience that are listening 
that I differ with the fact that library holdings should be depreciated and therefore are an exhaustible <coughs> asset. In my mind, the works of Shakespeare, Tolstoy, Yeats, Plato, and a thousand or a million other authors actually appreciate in value. They don't depreciate. And I'm not saying this in a negative way. I understand the rules of accounting, and this is part of that process. But to depreciate our library holdings and to the tune of 900 and some million dollars, I would argue that the holdings our library has don't have monetary value. They have value that's much greater than that, much, much greater than that. Unfortunately, we often don't recognize that. So in no way is this a depreciation of the value of those holdings that represents a paper shuffle from a financial perspective, not a human perspective. Thank you, President Cross. Regent Grebe, thank you, and the report will be accepted. We'll turn next then to item number 11 on our agenda. A key part of our budget request is focused on capacity building proposals. These initiatives are designed to increase student success and output with an emphasis on addressing the state's workforce needs. To grow capacity, it will require additional investments in faculty, support staff, or facilities to be able to enroll more students and produce more graduates in these high demand fields. At our October meeting, four of our chancellors gave us a closer look at the initiatives being proposed by their campuses. Today we'll hear from four more chancellors, <coughs> Chancellors Gao, Wachter, Van Galen, and Schmidt. If I could have those four chancellors please come forward. Good morning, Chancellors. Morning. Morning. Chancellor Gao, could you start it off, us off? Yes, and I think it's very fitting that I introduce you to our Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Betsy Morgan, a great colleague and friend. And she's the one that really put this together um, and ensures that it maximizes uh, the potential uh, that we're looking at. So, Betsy, if you would, please. Good morning, everyone. La Crosse focused on two of the major criteria for the capacity building. We're interested in Wisconsin's talent pipeline and student success, as of course all of us are in this room. Um, we really uh, had about a $1.75 million request, and our focus was on increasing the number of students in STEM-related or business-related degrees and to increase the retention of our students. I do want to predicate these comments by saying La Crosse is extraordinarily lucky, and we'd like to attribute it to skill, to have a very high retention rate of about 86% from the first year to the second year. Um, so when we say we're increasing our retention rate, lots of schools with lower ones think that uh, there's something wrong with us to even be concerned. But the main reason we are concerned is, one, we want to stay high, but two, because there are known equity gaps in our retention rate. So for instance, if you look at first generation students or students of color or students, a particular uh, kind of lethal combination is a first generation student who is undeclared after a year, then you're looking at retention rates as low as 65% sometimes. So when we look at retention, we're looking for those equity gaps. And so much of what you're looking at in response to our, what we're bringing forward has to do with um, attending to uh, known uh, group concerns. Um, I will do this very briefly, and apparently I'm in control here. I can drive mm. this thing. Oh, look at those slides coming in and out of it. Uh, so we're looking for uh, development of faculty in two areas. One be to develop an electrical engineering program. There would be three positions associated with that, presuming that we had all full authorization and what was needed. And the second is to expand our current accountancy and finance programs. As you all know, extremely hard to attract and retain faculty in those areas, but a very popular field with a lot of demand and our students going on to do great work in those fields um, and particularly in the state as a growing need within the state of Wisconsin. Our second major area has to do with preparing students for success and uh, advising and career services are our focus here. Uh, Lacrosse, uh, uh, again, we like to show off and tell you how great we are, particularly since you're visiting us. One of the areas of concern for us has been we have a relatively low um, 
approval would be better to, I don't know what, quite where to say that students uh, do not rate our advising as high as it should be, particularly compared to our peers. We've done a lot of great work in the last few years um, in terms of trying to get more proactive advising where students get pinged regularly with the, the kinds of information they need. But we'd like to see that improve, and so we'd like to uh, be able to invest in more professional advisors. We're a very faculty-heavy model. We want more professional advisors, particularly in students' early years, as they're dealing with those general education courses and the way of how, what kind of career direction they might wish to take. So our request focuses on six positions. One of those positions is a pre-health career advisor. We're ex really excited about this. This is the first time, we just launched it this fall, this is the first time that we have a located center within our academic advising center just for pre-health students who often get kind of ping-ponged around because they get a question from their bio faculty or their question from their psych or they talk to occupational therapy and they get different answers and we're trying to locate all that information. We have 2,000 students, so one in five of our students are consider themselves pre-health here at La Crosse. And so we want to add a career person so that can become a comprehensive center. And then the final area has to do with servicing students maybe more directly. The first is expanding undergraduate tutoring services. We have a, a very strong and robust tutoring center, mostly focused on STEM, so math, chemistry, and biology. They tend to be senior level students who then help first year students. One of the things that we find, and many schools do, is that when you provide tutoring, it's a great service, and you particularly get a lot of B students who want to get A's who show up to tutoring, and for what we really want, of course, is the students who are most at risk of not passing the class coming in to, to get a C, and so you're trying to say, well, how do you make sure that that, that is an ability and an opportunity for all those students? We've even found, interestingly enough, that sometimes if a faculty just member, member just gives, like, say, extra credit for showing up at tutoring, just getting them through that threshold, getting them through the door to, say, reduce the stigma of showing up for tutoring really improves proves the rates of the usage of those kinds of opportunities. So we're focusing on that. And finally, we have a relatively new division of diversity and inclusion, and they have requested a diversity education and training individual. Again, the idea is to be able to do the deep dive into what does it really mean when you talk about equity in a classroom? What does it mean when you're, you're uh, what we call a DFW, right? Student, number of students getting a D, F, or or withdraw from a class is substantially different based on people's ethnic backgrounds or first generation status. And that requires systematic work with faculty in a room with somebody with good expertise in this area to say, how do you design a classroom, for instance, collaborative learning that brings up the whole boat and raises the water that helps us all float. So that concludes the remarks on UWL's requests. Thank you. Chancellor Walker, you're up next. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about UW Superior. And uh, it may look like we have the same slides, but we are, we are also focused on <laughs> student success and the talent pipeline with a 1.75 request uh, to support those needs. In particular, when we talk about the talent pipeline, it's looking at how are we supporting that rural portion of the state that we occupy uh, in meeting those needs. To put this in context to understand uh, why our request is framed the way it is, I just need you to take a real quick look at who UW, UW Superior students are. And you'll notice a couple of things. One is they tend to be challenged. It tends to be very diverse. And it also represents what we call this new majority of who these students are going to be now and in the, over the next uh, decade and a half. So I think it provides some real opportunity for talent development when we talk about supporting these students. We've been focused the last few years on using an integrated model for student success that looks at everything from how we recruit our students to how we see them through to degree attainment. And so our initiatives are targeted at various points along that pipeline. Uh, we've built some very nice relationships with some schools, uh, particularly in our own backyard, that would increase from uh, attention devoted to them, so asking for a URM recruiter specifically devoted to that staff. We recently changed the last three years our professional advising model to an intrusive advising and model with professional advisors. But what we see with anything hands-on like that, it's incredibly intensive work. Uh, and the caseload needs to be smaller than what would typically be the standard for advising, so asking for additional advising staff. It's effective, but it's very time-consuming. We've talked to you, you've heard about the EAB 
analytic software. That's one of the initiatives we'd like to continue to pursue. It does take support staff to make the best use of any of those software tools. Uh, and finally, university studies redesign. We want to revamp it so that it's smaller, uh, has increased transferability because we know our students are either coming in, going out, uh, and is interdisciplinary. Financial support, we believe, is another critical piece, particularly for our student body. 56% of our Pell-eligible students declare themselves as independent, which means they're putting themselves through school. 38% of all the students filling out the FAFSA declare themselves as independent. So any hiccup in the financial resources of our students makes a huge difference in their ability to retain. So looking for scholarships in particular for transfer students, these are students that are often forgotten in that financial picture and also what we call extenuating circumstances funding because we know that our students sometimes have housing and food insecurity issues. So even being able to help out a few dollars along the way will keep them in school. Obviously career readiness, enhancing our career services, in particular paid internships, again with our students being independent, they cannot stop working to go on and do a traditional internship experience. So if we can ensure that those are paid, and that their cash flow is not interrupted, that will enable them to go out and get that valuable experience that they're going to need. Other experiential programs that we'd like to continue to enhance include our graduate assistant program and undergraduate research. And finally, addressing our rules, workforce needs, and our place-bound students. These are students, if you look at, at that territory, they can simply cannot afford to drive to get to a college campus. Uh, particularly when we're having conversations with our rural school districts, our superintendents, our principals, our CESA directors are telling us obviously the need for teacher recruitment is high and there are high need areas such as school psychology and school counseling. So we've been very effective this last year in what we did with our ed leadership program by revamping it, putting it online, making it accelerated, and having multiple entry points. That program went from 20 students to over 190 in a year. It tells us that there is a tremendous need for us to deliver programs that are accessible to them uh, in a way that they, they need. So we've got proposals for things like school counseling, school psychology, and other high area needs. Certificates, particularly in areas that we know that there's shortages, we always hear about uh, mental health treatment, chemical dependency. Those proposals are in our capacity initiatives as well. And finally, as we're talking about supporting this new minority where these place-bound students are, we need to make sure that our infrastructure to deliver those programs and the faculty teaching them are effective. So enhancing our digital strategies, we've got an innovative, what we think is an innovative model to pull together our library, our open educational resources, our Center for Teaching, Learning, and Distance Learning. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Chancellor Van Galen. Thank you. It's a pleasure to provide the board with some highlights of our capacity building initiatives. Uh, our proposal is built on uh, building a culture of innovation and fostering a new talent pipeline for Wisconsin. Uh, why innovation and why River Falls? Well, first of all, our campus strategic plan, Pathway to Distinction, actually has only three goals, one of which is innovation and partnerships. Therefore, our proposal builds on a campus strength, growing a culture of innovation, and that includes partnerships with businesses and communities. Another important element of context for this proposal is geography and demographics. To demonstrate this, can you identify what is in this image? Well, what you are seeing is a nighttime satellite image showing major Wisconsin cities with Milwaukee on the lower right and the Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area with its 3.6 million residents on the left. Here is UW-River Falls. We're located in one of the fastest growing regions of Wisconsin. In fact, the St. Croix Valley is growing and St. Croix County is projected to grow 42 percent between 2010 and 2040. Also, Polk and Pierce counties are projected for high growth uh, in their future. UW-River Falls is uniquely positioned within the UW system to be a major source of tomorrow's talent 
for a very dynamic part of our state where population, business, internship, and employment opportunities will continue to grow. So that's a bit of context. The first goal is building a culture of innovation. And our proposal will specifically address priorities within the system, including student retention, internships, and state priorities, including workforce development, attracting talent, and innovation and entrepreneurship. The accelerated innovation component will provide our students, faculty, and staff with even more intentional experiences that connect our campus to the university's growing business region and communities. And these are some examples of some of the work we have underway. You see in the upper right examples of innovation, the UW River Falls Hudson Center, which we recently expanded to serve adult degree completers, as well as graduate programs. In April, we opened the St. Croix Valley Business Innovation Center as a major partner uh, with our city and region. Uh, we are providing students with courses in innovation, a three-course innovation sequence. And of course, we've added some new innovative academic programs including data science, agricultural engineering, and neuroscience. So for our first goal, uh, it's really about accelerating innovation. And as I mentioned, this is very consistent with priorities of the UW system and the state of Wisconsin. So this first component will accelerate innovation. It will add new faculty positions around across a range of academic disciplines and within interdisciplinary areas that will specifically support innovation. We will also develop a new student innovation fellows program where student projects will be mentored by faculty and local entrepreneurs. Students will learn about intellectual property <clears throat> and how to take an idea to completion, including prototyping and possible, possibly the market. We will also start a faculty innovation fellows program that will provide our faculty with time and support for innovation activities, resulting in more partnerships with business and collaborative research. We will expand our efforts to implement university industry visiting professorships, which are jointly funded, in which professionals both teach and engage students at the university and work with regional businesses to serve as a bridge between UW River Falls and regional businesses. And then the second goal, which is really focused on developing a talent pipeline. We know that our state faces a significant talent shortage that will only increase over time. This program will connect more Wisconsin businesses with UW River Falls students as potential future employers. Key initiatives include expanding their already robust internship program providing stronger coordination and developing new student opportunities with a focus on Wisconsin employers. We will especially su uh, support this new pipeline with a strong focus on our approximately 3,000 students from Minnesota on our campus and underrepresented minority students and first generation students who are part of our Aspire program. We will expand our Career Trucks program. Over the last two years, we've included 200 of our students in visits to regional businesses. Students go there with faculty for a day and learn about that business, learn about internship and employment opportunities. We want to expand that program. And also we want to begin a innovation camp for students in sixth through 12th grade so they can help learn about how to do innovation. And also we'll have a in expanded partnership with Century College in White Bear Lake, Minnesota, which is our leading transfer institutions uh, and they have a, a program in entrepreneurship. So finally, uh, here are some of the outcomes that we anticipate coming from state funding of our capacity building initiative. 25 new business partnerships, an increase in the percentage of our graduates who complete an internship, practicum, our student teaching placement. Right now that percent is 59%. We'd like to increase that to 75% and will create 80 new student internships, resulting in 150 more students employed at Wisconsin businesses. Uh, thank you for the time to talk a little bit about the uh, Capacity Building Initiative from UW River Falls. Thank you, Chancellor. Chancellor Schmidt. Uh, thank you, Region President Bailing, uh, members of the Board of Regents, and President Cross for giving us the opportunity to talk about the importance of this particular aspect of the UW budget proposal. Um, capacity building investments are designated to address four guiding principles 
Our $1.75 million investment proposal actually checks all four bo boxes. It'll expand Wisconsin's talent pipeline, collaboration to spur innovation, ensure affordable education attainment, and will prepare our students for greater success. We are proposing an investment in three new programs at UW-Eau Claire, identified as critical to our state's future. Uh, uh, expanding our nursing program, biomedical informatics, and biomedical engineering. Before I talk about these in more detail, I want to acknowledge that our investment request is based on a foundation of excellence in STEM and healthcare programming already in place at UW-Eau Claire, and it reflects our institutional commitment because we've already been reallocating internal funds to get these programs up and going. So when this is approved by the legislature, we will be ready to hit the ground running. We all know that Wisconsin faces critical nursing shortage over the next 25 years. Um, I want to refer, there's a handout in your packet I'd encourage you to take a look at. It uh, highlights some of the demographics and some of the broad brush strokes of our program. We are facing a shortage of almost 10,000 nursing graduates by 2025, according to the Wisconsin Center for Nursing. UW-Eau Claire already has a strong nursing program. We were the lead campus for the Nurses for Wisconsin program a couple years ago, and we serve central Wisconsin through our Marshfield Base program. Expanding the talent pipeline for nursing is vital, especially in ways that can ensure affordable access for place-bound students throughout rural and small-town northwest Wisconsin. We are uh, proposing to expand our Bachelor of Science in Nursing completion program in Barron County, our new campus. We've already had conversations with major medical centers in Rice Lake and in Barron to talk about the benefits of helping their registered nurses complete the four-year degree. For individuals who want to stay in Barron County, this not only provides valuable professional development, but it offers students affordable access to a program where they live and already work. UW-Eau Claire knows how to do distance learning, thanks to our 31-year Marshfield Clinic partnership. We have the technical capabilities at UW-Eau Claire to make this program a reality in Barron County. The funding will enable us to create and staff a Rice Lake satellite with simulation lab, as well as recruit students to the program. The second phase of our investment proposal is to meet Wisconsin's increasing demand for biomedical professionals. We are proposing two new programs to meet targeted needs in northwest Wisconsin, biomedical engineering and bioinformatics. Both programs build on our existing strength in STEM and material science and engineering. Both programs will capitalize on our existing research agreement with Mayo Clinic. Mayo physicians and researchers have already expressed an interest in working with us in these two new fields. The U.S. Department of Labor predicts that employment for biomedical engineers and medical scientists will grow by 7.2 and 13 percent respectively over the next decade. We have a growing list of biomedical engineering companies in Milwaukee, Madison, in Minneapolis-St. Paul that need UW-Eau Claire graduates. Mertz Pharmaceuticals in Milwaukee, Promega and uh, Natus Medical in Madison, and Medtronic and Abbott Labs in Minneapolis. This program will only be the third biomedical engineering degree in the UW system, and the only such program at a comprehensive institution or in the northwest part of the state. Students who want to live and stay in this part of the state will be attracted to this program. I want to add that I've consulted uh, with UW Stout in River Falls as a part of our Northwestern Engineering Consortium. So again, that we're collaborating and working together on these engineering programs. Bioinformatics uses comp computational tours to mine, analyze, and use biological data to understand gene formation, cell regulation, <coughs> and the origins of treatment of disease. Employment in this field is expected to grow by 19% by 2026. Our graduates will find a strong pipeline to major corporations in Milwaukee and Madison, such as the Medical College of Wisconsin, Mayo Clinic, and the Mortgage Institute of Research. They will be well positioned for graduate programs at UW-Madison when they're completed. This will also be the only undergraduate program solely devoted to bioinformatics 
informatics in the UW system and the only such program at the undergraduate level in Wisconsin or Minnesota. In summary, investment in nursing, biomedical engineering, and bioinformatics will engage new partnerships in Barron County and existing partnerships with the Mayo Clinic and Marshfield Clinic to meet critical health care needs. The BSN completion program will serve rural and place-bound nursing professionals and expand our programming at the Barron County branch campus. Our biomedical engineering and bioinformatics programs will create new talent pipelines for emerging professions that will prepare Wisconsin students for success. Reflecting on the proposals uh, from my three colleagues and for those that you heard at our October meeting, I'm convinced that this creative approach to allowing institutions to focus on where they can most contribute to the state as a whole is the right way to go. We're on the ground, we're talking to business and community leaders, and I think you heard from all of the proposals that it's setting foot to go after what's most important for the state and for our students. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about these. Thank you, Chancellors. Regents, do you have any questions for our four Chancellors this morning? Regent Klein. I would just say I thought this was a really good presentation, and I'm very, um, very, very pleased with where we're all going with the, the possible budget funds, and thank you for doing that. Any other questions, Regents? If not, let's give our four presenting chancellors a round of applause. Thank you, Chancellors. Now I'll invite Regent Delgado to present our resolution of appreciation to UW La Crosse. Regent Delgado. Thank you. I'd be glad to, uh, to read this. I, I would like to especially thank Bill Gow for uh, a great reception here. And, and uh, as I said before, I congratulate you on the quality of the facilities that I have seen here. I did not have a chance to walk a lot out of the campus. I will have to do that at a future date, but uh, this is an outstanding facility, and I appreciate it. Well, luckily, you didn't have to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> As I read the, the resolution, whereas the members, there's a lot of whereas's here, whereas the members of the Board of Regents are, are pleased to recognize the University of Wisconsin La Crosse as the official host campus for the board's December 2018 meeting. And I'm grateful for the generous hospitality extended this month by Chancellor Joe Gao and the entire Eagle community. And whereas the board appreciated hearing Chancellor Gao's presentation about how UW La Crosse is sustaining excellence. And whereas the education committee thanks Provost Betsy Morgan for leading a presentation about the university's effort related to community-based ex experiential learning. And whereas the Research, Economic Development, and Innovation Committee was pleased to hear from the campus computer science team about the Wise funded on-ramp project, which is designed to provide better understanding of interconnected systems. And whereas the capital Planning and Budget Committee learn how the university is transforming, transforming science education at UWL. And whereas the board was delighted to hear from the, this month's student spotlight, Brittany Tribulet, a fifth year UW La Crosse student studying biomedical sciences with a minor in psychology. Be it therefore resolved that the Board of Regents thereby thanks UW La Crosse for this month's informative presentations, its forward-thinking spirit, and its many continued contributions to the UW system and to the state of Wisconsin. And a great representation of this fantastic metropolis, okay? Thank you. I just want to say 
thanks to two people that um, really deserve some recognition to make this great meeting happen. And that's Jess Lathrop from the system office. And wow, you can't appreciate how much collaboration um, happens. And so thank you for all that you do. <laughs> I hope is back in the room. Yeah, OK. Now this is interesting. You have to have somebody on your campus that'll take the lead, and it's a long process. And we did this five years ago, and this person did it so well. That's kind of the reward you get, that you get asked to do it again. And um, she's very humble, and, and I saw her get up and walk out earlier, and I thought, you gotta be here so we can express our gratitude. And so I texted her, and I said, are you still in the room? And she said, uh, no, do you want me to come in? And I said, yes, I'll be very grateful if you'll please come in, thanks. And then she wrote, I'm in now, any concerns? <laughs> no, not any concerns at all, but I think that demonstrates the attitude of always thinking, how are things going? And so it really is a, a pleasure to acknowledge Shustin Lang, stand up please, who did all of those leadership <laughs> We'll, we'll let you go next time. So, um, um, and then one final thing, when I welcomed you yesterday, I said, sorry for the cold temperatures. And when I came in this morning, there's that digital sign out front, nine degrees. I thought, boy, that's even colder than, you know, we, we uh, had forecasted. But I would hope um, that we're not gonna remember this meeting in La Crosse because it was cold outside we're going to remember how warm it was inside. This has been just a fantastic uh, series of collaborations and, and meetings, and I will always uh, remember this and um, you know, hope that you do too, and it's a reminder that we're all a part of something really significant and um, that leads the nation, this great UW system, and I feel so very privileged to be chancellor at this university. Thank you. Before we adjourn, I just have two announcements, Regents. First, Regents and Chancellors, please stop by the registration table to pick up an item from President Cross. And number two, in the UW Lacrosse folders, it includes a VIP dining card for people to use to purchase lunch. Those of you who know me know that lunch is very important. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, unless there's any questions or objections, we are adjourned, and thank you. Drive safe. <laughs>